I'm going to do something a little unconventional is I'm going to read, the first poem I'm going to read is the epilogue, which I always get them mixed up, the epilogue and the prologue, so it's, it's at the end of the book. And it's called What's in a Name? And uh, last summer I took a, a class in creative writing, poetry class. I audited the class, and it was the first time I'd been in a classroom in 50 years. And the poem is an acrostic, so the first letter of every line eventually spells my name. Man, what am I doing here? Away from a classroom for how many years? Running headlong into a whole new world, killing myself with doubt. Finding a new outlet for expression, learning what I never knew, emerging from darkness into the bright light of ideas. Surprising myself every day, hearing my words spewing out elegantly, noisily, passionately, rewarding myself when it sounds right. Next poem is actually the last poem I wrote for the book, and it's a little bit of a story. Um, last October, my girlfriend and I, we had a house guest for a week who was not the most agreeable person, shall we say, it was very difficult. And because of her health conditions, we had to take her back home to Oakland, California, where she lived. And after we dropped her off, we decided, boy, we need some recuperation. So we went to the um, Pacifica, California, near San Francisco, and kind of hung out on the beaches north and south of, of, uh, of the Bay Area. And when I got back, right around the 1st of November, I wound up writing this poem. It's called Ocean Gifts. A beach is but a beach when eyes see only expanses of sand and water. A beach is more when rocks jaggedly carved and whittled by infinite waves, millennium after millennium, rise from the crashing tide. A beach is more when stone cliffs plunge to the sea, when headlands majestically oversee their domain, when winged sentinels remain silent except for warning alarms should interlopers disturb their roost. What did the eye see 10,000 years before? What may the eye see 10,000 years ahead? A generation passed, a loved one since taken. Now the water suctions remorse and regret from the soul, transfusing renewal and rebirth into welcoming veins. Lubricating heartstrings, nourishing memory, loving once more, breathing anew, when a beach is more than a beach. Next poem is called Mountain Time, and it's about a place in Durango, Colorado, um, just outside of Durango, up in the mountains, and uh, it's a very quiet little place we go to from time to time. It's called Mountain Time. A river rushes, a bird calls, a zephyr sings. Who seeks answers finds truth, reigning in a paradise, crowned by a dollop of heaven. Stand on tiptoes, stretch skyward, imagine leaving fingerprints engraved on blue palettes. Unhurried clouds drift aimlessly toward undetermined ports of call. A river rushes, a bird calls, a zephyr sings. The next one I actually wrote when I lived in Big Flats, which was not too long ago, I'm like two years. Um, and it was a very dark, cold winter night. And for whatever reason, I got up at like two o'clock in the morning and looked outside and it was just dead silence and it was snowing and you know how the snow glistens sometimes. And, and it was just, just beautiful. So this poem is called Silent Night. Winter night. Stars still, moon silent, wind hushed. Hear snowflakes fall on frozen ground, almost. Tracks of rabbits, deer, maybe coyote, embedded without a whisper on white blankets. Window panes opaque with coats of stealthy frost. All sounds suspended in midnight chill. There's uh, two haikus in the book. One of them serious and this one kind of whimsical. Last, when was it? 
in the fall, we had a, an infestation of grasshoppers floating around. And as you might know, the roadrunner is the state bird of New Mexico, you know, from the cartoon guy. So I went out in the parking lot one day, and there was, must have been, I don't know, 100 grasshoppers flying around, floating around, and two roadrunners. And I just watched them for a little bit, and this is the poem that emerged, the haiku that emerged. A grasshopper flits, the roadrunner thrusts his tongue, breakfast is served. They were having a field day. Um, at a point in my life years ago, I was in the Air Force, and uh, my graduate school was a year in Vietnam. And uh, I said to someone who knows me really, really well, I wish I didn't write poems about Vietnam. And that person said to me, how could you not? And that was pretty true. Um, this poem has a couple of um, unfamiliar words or f terms, which I'll explain right now. One is an acronym, FIGMO, F-I-G-M-O, which stands for uh, bleep, I got my orders, <laughs> which means I got my orders for going home. And the other one, if you've served, anybody served in the military, you're probably familiar with, called short timer, where you have a very few days left to go and you're, 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 sh you're a short timer, you're short, as they say. And this poem is dedicated to the memory of uh, Rick Ramsey. Days to go, 208 until the sweet bird swoops and plucks me from this benighted place before dark messengers intervene. Rick the tease. I am the short timer. I am Figmo. I am 18 days in a wake up, boys. I am lucky man. Until an eerie whine awakens ghosts, then it impulsively explodes, sending rampaging shards of red hot shrapnel tumbling headlong. Cascaded into terror, ears concussed, eyes dust filled, spurting blood stipples my face, splatters across my chest. A cocktail for the dark messenger? One for whose road? Whose last call? Lucky man, until his lank body, shredded, sickeningly splayed about, scooped into a black rubber cocoon. Once the lucky man, now he is home too soon. Grief and guilt whirl in my mind's maelstrom, unable to decipher the impenetrable mystery how bombs and rockets and shells and bullets name their victims. Another lucky man tomorrow. Not my tomorrow. 207 if lucky man's mantle drapes these shoulders. Next one is called Red Dust. I think it was November 67. I had been in country about two months. I was a combat news reporter with the Air Force, and I got this assignment to cover this little party in a, in a town called Song Bay, fairly close to the Cambodian border. And it's one major characteristic was red dust. And after spending a few days there, I knew why they called it red dust. <laughs> On my face, in my ears, up my nostrils, only goggles shield my eyes. Welcome to Song Bay and red dust and Operation Eagle Thrust. Red dust swirling in the prop wash of caribous and providers, whose pilots skillfully negotiate a too short runway, lifting off, loaded with fresh-faced troops, their tickets punched for the next performance of this theater of the absurd. And me, weighted by notebooks, cameras, recording all this for someone's posterity. Me, a few months removed from a second Cape summer where I wore starch class A's, three stripes adorning each sleeve. Pete, Surfer John, Jimmy Lee and me, CC and Ginger on payday nights, hearing sweet voice Jan sing, even after we ended our fling. Now in combat regalia, 38 holstered on my hip, M16 slung over a shoulder, awake in bunkers each night, protected from mortar shells, showered from VC perches, we abandon each night, and they forsake at dawn in this game I call musical hilltops. 
If there is a God, I will find a long and steamy and powerful shower to dissolve red dust. Not yet, God says. I am stranded in Dalat, cool in the mountains, summer playground when emperors ruled. Pallets of lettuce bound for the general's mess bump me from my flight. The general's mess. Oh, yes. I get my shower next day, long and steamy and powerful, scraping red dust from my tired self. Red dust gone, the red dust I see, not the sweet smell of aviation gas, nor the accurate smell of gunpowder. Red dust, the vision, all remain. Um, okay. I came home from Vietnam on Friday the 13th, 1968. Friday, so Friday the 13th is not an unlucky day for me. Very lucky day. And so I wrote a poem called Freedom Flight. Um, at the end of the poem, there's a couple lines in, in uh, Hebrew, which I do translate. But if you hear a strange language, that's what it is. Freedom Flight. Friday the 13th, lucky or not, I wonder, clamoring aboard my Pegasus, thinking if others are aware. We've spent our year, some a few months longer, a year shaking and shaping my world. Tet. No need to say more. A year when slain civil rights leader enters the permanent vocabulary. A year when a devil in the city of angels murders another heroic brother. Now remembered names emblazoned streets and schools and stadiums they will never see. A year when a tormented president whose massive right hand once grasped mine tells his divided nation, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination for another term. I return to nowhere, to no one, better than somewhere, someone, I belong only to me. Friday the 13th, keep the runway clear of craters, free from a random rocket's havoc, quietly, slowly, push back, navigate the labyrinth of concrete aisles, wheeling to start position, engines at max thrust, RPMs climbing, brakes released, we hurtle ahead, five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, Hail Mary, full of grace, angling toward the blue vastness aloft in the dank air of late summer. In a minute, an unseen voice. Ladies and gentlemen, we have left the airspace of South Vietnam. A tsunami of cheers washes over all. Home, my man, back to the world. Guam, Hawaii, finally California. The land of round eyes, Friday the 13th. Lucky day. Baruch Hator Adonai Eloheinu Melech Halam Hatu Vahamatu. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, the good and doer of good. This is another quote unquote war poem. Um, I was reading an article somewhere about the effect on troops in Afghanistan and Iraq, not so much the physical effect, but um, the mental kind of philosophical effect. And uh, I wrote this poem called The Unknown Price. For eight dollars and a few cents, I can buy shoe goo, a compound of toluene and solvent naphtha to repair a sole flapping away after divorcing from the leather boot on my right foot. Eight dollars and a few cents. Think what of such, a, such amount might repair not S-O-L-E-S, but S-O-U-L-S. Returning from desert battles, mountain conflicts, firefights in teeming urban neighborhoods, remote mud-hutted villages. Souls and broken bodies, or bodies opaquely hold to the naked eye. People with titles, with strings of letters following their names, speak of moral injury unseen wounds inflicted, undetected by metal machines, medical machines. A dark-skinned, dark-eyed 10-year-old brandishes a grenade. A 20-year-old grunt shoots him dead. The grenade falls to the ground, but not exploding, but bouncing among other rocks. The soldier hardened beyond his years, hardened for all his days, a damaged soul drowned in guilt, moral injury. Restoration upon their return, how, where? 
rites of penitence, purification, values and beliefs betrayed, questioning motives of deities, asking how gods allow such acts, abandoned by higher powers, moral injury, what price? Okay. Time to lighten it up. Um, subconsciously or otherwise, I finally realized that a fair amount of my poems, some that are in the book, some that are not in the book, have the same titles as songs or movies. Like Lucky Man is an Emerson, Lake, and Palmer song. This is another um, poem that's not in the book called She's Gone, which is Hall and Oates or Seals and Crofts or somebody like that. This one started out as Men in Black. And my poetry prof said, you know, there's a movie by the same name. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, right. So it's now called Gotta Get Me a Black Turtleneck. And it's kind of a uh, look back at uh, a very, very early time in my life, like high school, early college. Men reading their poetry don't wear black turtlenecks, at least not, not like another time. In New Mexico, army fatigue jackets, L.L. Bean hunting shirts, REI chic, vests graced by Native American symbols, none unexpected. One fellow even wore a button-down white shirt accessorized by a striped tie. No black turtlenecks in the house. When we called presidents three-letter words, high school hipsters read Ferlinghetti, Ginsburg, Corso, pretending they dug every word, every nuance. Village tables encircled by true and imagined literati, sipping sugarless, creamless coffee, mesmerized by turtleneck, goatee, shades-wearing, cool chic masters, drawing smoky puffs through tortoise shell, tortoise shell holders. Hands unmet in praise and approval, snapping fingers to applaud, so very with it in 1950s New York City. Later discussed the sound of one hand clapping, confronting this conundrum as scholars might wrangle over arcane Talmudic passages. Parading along Bleecker Street, we disdainfully sidestep tourists from the heartland, cameras dang dangling from their leathery necks. Legions of Hoosiers, Buckeyes, Gophers, Badgers, Hawkeyes, straight from delis where laconic Jewish waiters rolled their eyes while silently delivering pastrami on soggy white bread, slathered and spread with Hellman's best. We down underage beer at the testosterone turf of McSorley's old alehouse on 7th, next to White Horse on Hudson, a few years too late to eavesdrop on the original Dylan, for his last call sounded in chilled darkness six weeks before the Albin Arthen of 1953. Wonder if he wore a black turtleneck going gently or not into that good night. I construct occasional lines reciting when connected to courage. Gotta get me a black turtleneck, I think. The Albin Arthen, by the way, is Welsh for the light of winter, the, the winter solstice. Okay. Um, about a year, a little over a year ago, I took a workshop from a terrific poet in, in uh, Albuquerque. She's originally from Minnesota. Anyway, the workshop was called Food as a Metaphor. And some of these poems were written during the workshop, some, some after. Um, first one is called The Sandwich, the in quotes. Rye bread, two slices crusted with mahogany, flecked with caraway seeds, spread with grainy yellow mustard, hosting silvery-skinned, oily sardines, a purple ringlet of onion, Swiss cheese, nutty and dense. Unseen and unmade, the gauntlet untaken, only I accept the dare. In other words, nobody else is going to make it except me. Um, Coffee was a favorite topic. This one is called uh, Joe. A cup of Joe, Java, coffee, hot, black, strong. Cappuccinos, espressos, lattes, skip the fancy concoctions created by someone striving for the exalted title of barista. Turning levers, twisting handles, making enough steam to power a moderately sized seagoing vessel. How about a decaf? Why bother? 
A coffee lover's shirt blares, Co bad coffee sucks, profound. Pour me coffee slightly less thick than 10W30 motor oil. Turkish coffee so dense a spoon stands upright, a silver obelisk in a black pool. How many cups a day? Depends on what you read, who you ask. Might send my blood pressure out of range. That's bad. Might reduce my chances of pancreatic cancer. That's good. You pay your money. You take your chances. Next one has a little, little bit of a story to it. My girlfriend and I were sitting down one day for lunch, something light, like roast beef sandwiches. And she got up, went to the closet, and I said, where are you going? She said, uh, I'm going to get the potato chips. I said, don't bother. <laughs> so the poem is called Crispy, Crunchy, Gone. Don't look for the potato chips. I ate them, ate them all, every blessed son of a spud. Ate them with roast beef, rare and red, partnered with the yellow of pinyon, garlic, mustard, spread on multigrain rounds. Red and yellow, colors of New Mexico's flag and banners unfurled in Spain and Sicily, Macedonia and Montenegro, by ancient enemies, China and Vietnam, in Kyrgyzstan too. Yes, I ate the potato chips. Low salt baked chips you bought four days ago, or two days you insisted. 60% less salt. Thank goodness not no salt, for, my ta for the taste receptors of my tongue leap at briny sensations, seasoned temptations. Yes, I ate the potato chips. Not at once, but over a few days. Each fresh chip, crisp as a newly printed sawbuck, crunchy like crinkly paper. Yes, I ate them all. And yes, they were really good. And yes, I remembered to put a rubber band around the bag so the chips stayed fresh and crispy and crunchy. Um, the last one in this section about food is a little four-liner, and it also was... Um, inspired by that house guest who was very, very difficult. She had said to us that before coming to Albuquerque, she had, she had eaten in a restaurant in, in Oakland, and she had a really, really terrific squash risotto. Okay? And I said, well, I'm a fair hand in the kitchen. I think I can make a pretty fair squash risotto. So I did. And um, the poem is called Aria for Arborio. Arborio, of course, the kind of rice you use in a risotto. It's a little four-line poem. The risotto does not sing, she complained. Put batteries in your hearing aids. Be still, then listen, he replied. Uh, where do I want to go here? Right. This poem is called um, Bird of Light. Blackbird rests on a solitary wire, now soaring alone, higher, yet higher, descending near on powerful wings, favoring me with song so sweetly she sings. Though ebon in color, black as night, her mystical power turns dark into light. I know her by name in a language romance for all of our time. Pray together, we dance. Mm. My girlfriend's birthday is July 4th. So last July 4th, I wrote this poem, and it's called For July 4th. Move over, America. Sorry, but you're in the back seat playing second fiddle. Today I share my fourth of her milestones. I have I've lots of catching up to do. Wide eyes wonder at your fireworks, yet we ignite our own. March in private parades, hearts exchanging salutes. Remembering our declarations, independent bodies orbiting in tandem around convergent selves. Let others run up old glory. We exult in the new, created mutually, happily free, embracing life's liberty. Okay. Next poem is called Unlikelies, and Merle, my girlfriend, is a very caring and compassionate person, intensely loyal to her friends, and a couple of her friends were having a rough time of it, and she was kind of feeling down about that. So I decided, or I felt, 
she needed a little silliness in her life, a little lightheartedness. So I wrote this poem called Unlikelies to cheer her up. When rivers flow backward and mountains grow downward, when roosters crow at dusk and owls awaken at dawn, when the moon is never full and stars never shine, when armadillos fly and bluebirds swim, and donkeys howl and coyotes bray, when kings bow to peasants and lions cede their throne, when airplanes run on pickle juice and diamonds lose their luster, when fires resemble icicles and ice cubes turn to ash, when deserts become oceans and camels float out to sea, when no one reads Shakespeare and man abandons war, when these unlikelies happen, if impossibles come true, only in such imaginary moments shall I not treasure you. Thank you. Thank you. That poem um, also was published in a magazine called Leonardo, which is the uh, literary and arts magazine of Central New Mexico Community College, where I took the poetry class last year. This poem is called Morning, as in time, 5 a.m., 6 a.m., but the, the birds are called morning doves, M-O-U-R-N. Morning doves solemnly coo a preamble to parking lot crunches, heralding delivery of this day's news, the same daily news as yesterday, and the day before and the day to come, I bet. Death, destruction, maltreatment, malfeasance, abuse, aggression, arrogance, unwanted incursions, ill-advised excursions, incessant drumbeats of despair. Find Albuquerque sharing latitude 35.05 with Chattanooga, Tennessee, Gundagai, Australia, Nicosia, Cyprus. At longitude 106.39, Saskatoon, Canada, Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, join the Duke City. And their news. Drug trafficking gangs attack southern civility in the shadow of Lookout Mountain. Aussies tolerate Aborigines, yet they send Middle Eastern asylum seekers to Cambodia. Turks and Greeks forever squabbling in Cyprus. What, you think they're chatting amiably while sampling tumblers of Uzo and Iraq? Crime, high HIV rates, cloud the prairie, but Canadians seem too damn polite to discuss such unpleasantries. Juarez, we know that script, and that's the news. Uh, I'm going to dedicate this poem to uh, our videographer because he used to live in Oakland, California, correct? Okay. This is called Circling the Square. My partner and I are lost in the city by the bay. Not the city, but Oakland. Gertrude Stein, there is no there there. Civic bu boosters now proclaim Oakland as the place where it's at. Who can say? Still the city of the fall, short again athletics of the baseball world. We're hapless and woeful among adjectives applied to football's hapless and woeful raiders. Where freeways honor architects of long ago victories. Where the coast starlight, California Zephyr, and freight cars carrying invisible cargoes rumble down the Embarcadero, the spine of Jack London Square, the place we can't find. Oh, sorry, uh, somewhere I got lost talking about how we got lost. We drive into one of those on every corner gas station mini-mart combos where a smiling but equally lost Chinese girl suggests asking folks filling up at the pumps. She knows directions, a shaved head black dude tells me, pointing to a woman of undetermined age, his mom or grandmother or aunt. Dreadlocks frame a face brimming with warm cocoa perfectly cast for a funky movie set in Savannah or New Orleans or lingering on the pages of Carl Hyacinth's latest. Jack London Square. Her eyes seem deep in thought, perhaps searching for messages from hidden cartographers. Okay, take a right out of here, go right on Webster, through the Alameda Tunnel in the right lane, then... I listen intently, hoping her words register on my internal GPS. I've got it. Right, 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 the tunnel. A troika of hugs, mutual God blesses, deliverance of thanks. We're on our way. We are not. Our guardian angel waves us to a halt. 
Follow us when we pull away at Jackson Street. You keep going and you'll hit the square. Blessings bestowed again. 30 minutes later, we find the square and our hotel for the next two nights, thanks to our unnamed benefactor. Gertrude Stein, meet the Black Madonna, the there of this city, by the bay. Um, I'm going to read a couple of poems that I've written since the book came out. Um, a few months ago, I was invited to join a program called Now See Here that was uh, co-sponsored by the New Mexico Humanities Council. And what it did, it took eight poets and eight artists, paired them, um, and then the poet and the artist got together and they selected a work of art and the po poet wrote a poem about that particular work of art. And the exhibition ran for the whole month of May at the New Mexico Humanities Council in, in Albuquerque. And this, this was the work of art, I don't know if you can see it, but that's the one I, w I paired with. And as soon as I saw it, the artist was a wonderful woman named Iva Morris. I said, this is the poem I want to do, or the work of art I want to write a poem about. Of course, immigration is a major topic around the country, and very much so in the Southwest. And this was Iva's rendition of what the Statue of Liberty might look like today, at least in her, her eye. So I wrote the poem called Lady Liberty Redo, and it begins with two lines from a poem that I'm sure you all know. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Emma Lazarus, 1883. And they came, two score million over a generation, and we welcomed them, not always with open arms. And still they came, stitching our clothes in airless sweatshops, digging our coal, forging our steel, laying our rails, pickaxes, shovels, hammers, their calling cards. And still they came crammed into dark and dank tenements, set upon by iron fists directed by closed minds. Chinks, wops, spicks, mix, kikes, hunkies, polacks, unwelcome in this school, in this, in this restaurant, in this store. And still they came, and they stayed. Their children and their children, children's, children's children prevailed. Now doctors and scientists, judges and lawyers, artists, athletes, actors, playwrights and poets. And when they fell in war, ominous raps on portals, death knells of doorbells, harbingers of crushing loss, uncomfortable messengers fumbling for comforting words. And still they come, Lady Liberty, riding not wave crests but crossing a river, guided, misguided by hungry coyotes, the welcoming lamp extinguished, the golden door tarnished and latched. Lucky ones win approval, searching for a personal El Dorado. Others labeled undocumented, branded illegal by shrill voices, look over their shoulders, cock an ear for the man, while the powerful posture and pose. And who comes now? From the shadows, the young, vulnerable, threatened, denied liberty's light, they are detained, deported, their dreams diminished. And you, my lady, where is your sacred tablet of law? Where is your invitation? Where is your guiding light lifted beside the open door? Okay. Um, um, I was in Cuba, not Cuba, New York, not Cuba, New Mexico and not the other three or four Cubas around the country, but Cuba and the Caribbean. Uh, I was there in March for a week, and um, this poem is one of four I wrote about Cuba. There's a little bit of Spanish in there. The first line translates to flea market. <laughs> the poem is called Bienvenido. El Mercado de las Polgas en la Plaza de Armas awash with a cornucopia of wares, Latin entrepreneurs hawk behind rickety stalls. Books, posters, music, watches, military medals, all eligible for bargaining. Che, martyr or murderer, still the iconic rock star of the revolution, now in the post-utopian era of deprivation. 
his image imprinted everywhere, shirts, hats, books, billboards, sides of buildings, and images of Fidel, invisible, though his hand guided and his grip tightened for decades. No statues to topple when natural yearnings spawn the inevitable downfall. A young man shadows me, his eyes seesawing between my face and a postcard-sized likeness worth a dollar or two for a portrait sketched by this self-named Super Picasso. Now a brown-skinned, bedraggled man wearing a shirt crusted in dirt holds out an equally discolored palm while jabbing at a blackened hole in his throat where you and I give our Adam's apples not a second thought. Another dollar brings a kiss to my shoulder. We meet again on the plaza's far side, his finger again pointing, his palm again outstretched, seeking another coin. He does not recognize me, or do Americanos all look alike. La Plaza de la Cathedral, where tourists fill the pews of the Baroque monument to the Blessed Virgin. Religious freedom exists, we are told, but Cubans prefer praying at home, often mixing the mysteries of Santeria with Catholic conundrums, all sub subject to change since Raul and Francis became best amigos. A girl no more than 20, a twisted right leg propped against a stone pillar, withered right arm seeking help. I cannot refuse. Her lips invisibly plant DNA on my hand, her coffee eyes speak to my heart. Eyes widen with idealism, eyes wide with idealism. The Venceramos, defenders of the revolution, cut cane with machetes as if beheading Yankee capitalists, perhaps never admitting the sugar <coughs> sweetens the tea stirred in the dachas of despots ruling Mother Russia. The same motherland executing, starving, enslaving how many tens of millions? And when the masters in Moscow imploded, Havana felt aftershocks of economic collapse, labeled special period by wordsmiths in the ministry of euphemisms. Contradictions, contrasts, co complexities. Medical care free. Doctors earning 20 bucks a month. Ration cards for everyone. Where is the balance? Education free. Dissent allowed but not too loud. Donde esta el equilibrio? Illiteracy eradicated. L read, listen to it all. Messages from the state. Where is the balance? Firing squads, we're told, executed only, only about 100. What is the truth? Those shot were brought to trial. Que es la verdad? The trials were fair and just. What is the truth? I say embargo. You say blockades, splitting hairs while playing at charades. Um, a while back, I kind of got uh, nostalgic about family members. Started writing a series of poems about relatives. And this one is called Grandma Clara. Don't worry, Claire, it's not about you. <laughs> My daughter. Grandma Clara, her hair blonde nevermore, never untwisted from its neatly pinned bun, wire-rimmed spectacles astride the bridge of a slender nose, lenses sitting on delicately etched cheekbones. 98 pounds of cigarette-smoking, beer-drinking Grandma Clara. Not just any cigarette, but Raleigh's, faithfully saving the coupons in each pack as I collected baseball cards and Topps bubblegum wrappers. My dad also smoked Raleigh's. He didn't give a hoot about coupons or premiums to exchange for some chintzy appliance bound to go belly up in six or eight months. He turned his coupons over to Grandma when we visited every other week or so. She kept the coupons in tightly rubber-banded stacks, same as I did with baseball cards, until Redemption Day arrived. As for Grandma's beverage of choice, well, just not any beer, but Natty Bow. National Bohemian, Maryland's finest, dutifully brought from Baltimore by Clara's daughter, my Aunt Rosalie, whose given name was really Rose. Grandma Clara called her Rose. Grandpa Philip called her Rose. Census records called her Rose. I know. I checked. I am curious. Grandma Clara celebrated 
maybe recognized as a better word, Hanukkah and Christmas in an ecumenical manner, simply merging them into one I silently called Chrysica. No unwrapping of presents, no lighting of menorah candles, no frying of potato latkes, no spinning of dreidels. Nope, Grandma Clara's Hanukkah or Chrysica tradition was a roast goose. She assumed the identity of a renowned chef, piercing the bird so its pools of fat might be drained from the roasting pan, declaring the bird had reached the desired degree of crispness and the gamey meat still moist. In time, the Raleigh's caught up with Grandma Clara. Maybe the Natty Bows did too. I was in Ohio in college when her already fragile heart gave out. I wanted to come home to see her one last time. My dad said no, stay in Ohio, just write to Grandpa Philip. After Grandma Clara died, Dad stopped smoking Raleigh's, switched to Pell Mell's, I think. Didn't see any Natty Bow bottles except when I visited Aunt Rose in Baltimore from time to time. Years later, I drained the fat from the roasting pan, decided the skin was sufficiently crispy and the gamey meat still moist when my family of mixed faiths celebrated Chrysica. And uh, last poem. It dawned on me five or six days ago that the date of this reading was June 6th. And a light bulb went off, I'm kind of a history buff, and I said, oh, June 6th, okay, I know what that means. Pretty significant day in American history and world history, for that matter. So I wrote this poem called June Morning. A morning in June, like none other past, like none other since. Blood and bodies stain waters churned by an armada of iron and steel, dispensing its passengers into the maelstrom, or rocking the earth with thunder. The fortunate, their faces imprinted in the pebbled sand, crawl through steel barbs, greeted by fusillades of fire, cannons roaring, lethal messages of machine guns splitting the air, grenades pausing a second or two before their shards rip through flesh. Omaha, Juno, Utah, silver and sword, names once readily paired with this June morning. Now unfamiliar places and pages rarely read in books scarcely opened. Soon, only marble monuments and row after row after row of immaculate symbols will remember. Soon a headline on page one, or might more likely elsewhere, whispers our last survivor of this June morning is gone. A volunteer answering the call, or another seeking no exemption coming from fertile fields, forests of pine, aspen, cottonwood, grassy plains of his heartland or where spires hide the sun. Afterward, he wrapped strong arms around his sweetheart, carried his lunch pail again, or sat behind a desk, or stood behind a store counter, or discovered a welcoming classroom. His eyes misted, and he shook his head no when we called him hero, and he spoke little of what he saw and felt and smelled that June morning like no other June morning. Thank you very much. Mark, you realize that Oakland now has the Golden State Warriors. I know that. I should have edited the poem, though. I edited, <laughs> you're a fan. I wrote the poem before the NBA, well before the NBA playoffs. I know. I know. I know. But. Well, okay. I thought that yes. the for me, the, the, the poetry that really touches me is when it's very physical in, in its imagery and when it's emotional. The one about your grandma, Claire, was very moving. You know, it, it's, thank you. Um, I spent 20 plus years in newspapers writing newspaper stories where, you know, you, you throw the facts out there, bam, 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 you make them as clear as possible. And then I started writing poetry a little over four years ago. I never liked poetry. Um, I thought it was, you know, I'd, I'd read in school, you know, Emily Dickinson, and I'd say, what the heck is she trying to say, and so on and so forth. And don't ask me wh what prompted me to start writing poetry, because I don't know. I just sat down one day and wrote something that was... I don't even remember what it was. But 
I had a very, at first and still sometimes, a very difficult time writing with, you know, putting out images and imagery because I, my background was, you know, okay, here's the facts, A, B, C, D. You don't need to, you know, need to sit there and wonder what, you know, what, what's this story about? So sometimes poems come out and they're almost, well, I guess they're, they're kind of narrative in the sense of a story, sometimes with not a lot of imagery. And sometimes they are very much filled with imagery. The, the poem I read, Bird of Light, that is about my girlfriend. And I have a dear friend in Kentucky um, who really knows, I don't say she really knows what makes me tick. And she, she challenged, and I was telling her about this difficulty, and she challenged me, she said, write a poem about Merle where you don't mention her name, that you, you conjure up images, and that was the poem. And that may have been one of the first poems I wrote that was really chock full of, of images like that. Because I, I found it, and still do sometimes, found it very difficult to, to do that. But do you see the use of your images at, as that which most sets your po poetic writing apart from your reporting? Probably, yeah. Probably. yeah. And somebody asked me, well, what's your poetic voice? And I said, well, on Monday it might be serious, on Thursday it might be, you know, what I think maybe is a little comical. And if, if you look at the back of the book, is the description says, if you're using musical terms, it ranges through several octaves and, and up and down the scale to divine inspirations and poetic voice. I mean, it's, it's all over the map. Although I will say, I've probably written, since the book came out in December, I don't know, 35, 40 poems, and for the most part, they are far more serious. I, th I can only offhand only think of three or four of them that might qualify as some degree of humor. Um, some of them are, I won't say they're dark, but, they, but they're, they're more serious. So again, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, appreciate you coming out on a beautiful Saturday day. Yeah.